we were trained to work out, but what about working in? Whether the topics are mental health, meditation, spirituality, holistic medicine, or sexuality, host Josh Bienemann and guests have real conversations about balance and personal growth within the sports community. This is Locker Room Alchemy. What is happening, guys? I'm Josh Bienemann, and welcome to episode number three of Locker Room Alchemy. This episode was a ton of fun for me personally. I'm really hoping that everyone enjoys it. I got to introduce two people that I'm very close with. The first person is Larry Mosley, who's going to be joining me a lot on these podcasts. Uh, Larry is a personal friend of mine, as well as a colleague in the baseball industry. Larry has a background in baseball. He's played pretty much his entire life, and he began coaching full-time eight years ago. And, and on top of that, he is a high school baseball coach and has been a varsity head coach for three years. And our main guest is Chris Story, who is the director and founder of Primal Alchemy. Primal Alchemy is a superhuman optimization brand that's based in the UK. Chris also hosts the Red Pill Initiation Hour podcast. I'm going to leave information for Primal Alchemy along with the Red Pill Initiation Hour uh, down in the description for this episode. A few of the topics we talk about are masculinity within sports, the attributes of divine masculinity, toxic masculinity, bullying, and the psychology of bullying, and some other really intriguing subjects. As Larry said best, Chris is a wild boy. He is very comfortable in his skin and uh, very direct when it comes to his viewpoints on sports culture and especially masculinity within that culture. So whether or not you agree with everything he says, I think it's definitely going to open your mind and uh, maybe generate some discussions, which this podcast is all about. So hope you enjoy. Chris, what is happening, man? All good, all good, big man. Thanks for having me on. Been looking forward to this for a while. This has been in the makings for a few months now since I first met you. And uh, yeah, man, I'm proud of how far you've come and I'm looking forward to uh, yeah, expressing some ideas on here, sharing some ideas and getting to know Larry a little bit more in the process. Yeah, this is uh, this is surreal, man. This is uh, this is everything coming full circle, like uh, like life always seems to do, man. Um, if you can just let everybody know who Chris Story is, I, I've got the uh, the privilege to know you over the last six months or so. Uh, but who Chris Story is, and a little bit about Primal Alchemy. Yeah, for sure. So for everybody that's listening who may not be familiar with myself or my brand, Primal Alchemy. Uh, so I'm the director of Primal Alchemy. I'm the creator of it. Uh, Primal Alchemy is what I believe to be. I may be wrong unless someone is uh, doing the same work as me behind the scenes without me knowing. The world's only what I refer to as the superhuman optimization brand. So what we do is we unify ancient ancestral wisdom with 21st century science in order to create a line of premium lifestyle products and services that are intended to like, optimize one's physical, mental and spiritual capabilities. So that's it on like, I guess you would say like the, the front shelf of the brand, but the much deeper kind of like mission of the brand is to help, I would say, accelerate the evolution of consciousness on this planet. And there's a, a shitload of information that we can go into regarding that, in regards to how we go about doing that with my brand or how I go about doing that because I kind of am the brand. It's only me doing it. But uh, yeah, there's uh, there we're living in a very peculiar time and that's not referring to this whole coronavirus situation that we're in. It's uh, that something else that we could talk about if, ne if needed. But the, the time that we're living is very special. It's very special for a reason and it's been prophesied for thousands of years that this is a time of an awakening. A mass awakening not just a few people here and there jotted around the world that religions get built around this is a mass awakening where we all become or we're all destined to become those figureheads that we look at in these religious texts like a jesus like a buddha like a muhammad all, all, of, all of these godlike figures is what we're destined to become um primal alchemy is about i would say bringing those knowledge those knowledge or those sort of wisdom teachings to the normal man to the normal guy down the street that has no fucking clue what a pineal gland is and what DMT is and all of that and about being able to, you know, grind people and then be able to build the temple of man from a solid foundation. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the basics of primal alchemy. If you want me to go into a little bit more detail about myself, 
I can do, but you'll have to uh, reel me in, Josh, and make sure that I don't ramble because I have a habit of doing that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. Yeah, with, um, I guess, with the awakening, we'll start right there. That's, um, that's been, I guess, the, the, the juice behind me uh, getting this thing going here. So with me and, and deciding to um, try to implement some of the things that I'm learning into the sports community and thinking about my own challenges throughout uh, athletics and coaching and just um, being in the sports community, masculinity was always uh, and still is always at the forefront. So if you can just dig, I guess, right into uh, – masculinity within this awakening yeah for sure dude so just to give a bit of groundwork uh, just to cover what you're saying then with the um the whole sports industry there is a massive well just as a whole actually there is a massive misconception of what spirituality is uh that is mostly due to propaganda and just a just a lot of shill activity on social media and mainstream media in regards to what is spirituality? When we think of spirituality, we think of the 60s sort of like rebellion movement of like the hippie culture and everyone out smoking weed, every, everyone out just like taking LSD, getting fucked up. E everyone's chaining around like with daisies in their hair, singing Kumbaya. And it's not the case. It's, it's a, that's a real false image of what spirituality is. And on the opposite end of that, you've got people that are completely disconnected from their spiritual essence and you you be, you become very identified with it's, it's a bit of a i don't really like the term but it's a term that's well served at the moment like toxic masculinity it's again i don't particularly like that term because it's a little bit overused and sort of like monetized now but you get you get men that are just very disconnected from their true self and that's through both an ancestral sort of baggage that you inherit an ancestral inheritance from your mum and dad from their mum and dads and from your from your family um, bloodline and also just through social conditioning when we grow up as men uh i'm i'm a, i'm 26 at the moment so even i still I guess were was impacted by this but i know generations before me were definitely impacted by this uh, when you when you grow up, you're taught to be. If you're a man, you're taught to be a certain way, and it's that over the years, over conditioning, like programming, you 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 gain all these preconceived ideas, or you inherit all these preconceived ideas of what being a male is. And males, uh, through when we grow up, when we're watching TV and we're watching our favorite sports, we're watching our favorite sporting heroes, we're watching our favorite action heroes. If you grew up in the '80s, you're probably watching like Sylvester Stallone. Arnie, some of those guys back then, those guys are not the essence of a divine masculine. They're the, they're the essence of a badass, but they never really show traits of a good human. They, they're just, they just, they really um, mirror the, the I, I would call some of the positive aspects of masculinity, but, all, but also the, the negative aspects of masculinity, which is like not showing emotion, be, being very sort of over dominant, be, being very abusive, being very unthoughtful, um, and uh, other, other sort of characteristics that, that could be associated with the shadow masculine. Yeah, so, so, uh, so Chris, just, uh, I, mean, I mean, we're obviously, uh, or we obviously all grew up in the whole, uh, you know, uh, bubble of, of sports and this and the other. Um, when, when it comes to, to, uh, to, uh, some of your teammates, your, your former teammates, the guys who had that whole, you know, mass masculinity and the guys who kind of faked it, how do you actually see them operating in the real world now that, that they don't have the protection of, you know, universities or this and the other to actually put them up on the old pedestal that they don't have anymore? To be, honest with, to be honest with you, Larry, I don't really know any of them now. Like, I don't necessarily keep in touch with any of them. But mm -hmm. what, what, I, what I can see consistently is that they, th this is a big jump when, you, when you're looking into psychology and you're looking into the shift between boy psychology into man psychology. It's a little mm -hmm. bit of difference in regards to how we express ourselves. And generally speaking, I see that most men in today's world are operating on a boy level psychology and boy level of understanding their own 
psychological needs and psychological sort of personality, you could say. And yeah, man, my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, ex-girlfriend told me that too, by the way. So you're, uh, yeah. you're on, you're on to be a right, uh, the right tread right there. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think that's the case, man. I think, um, the, the issue with, I'll try and wrap it back into sports. I think the yeah. issue is what happens is that we're very disconnected from our ancestral traditions. Uh, back in the day, we always would have had to go through some rite of passage. Females go through a rite of passage essentially as soon as they start their period. As soon as they start, mm-hmm. they start their moon cycle, that shows them that they are essentially a woman and that they're ready for, well, you know, to, be, to become pregnant and have a child. Whereas boys don't really have that sort of such a clear signal. So mm-hmm. in ancient times, there used to be some form of rite of passage, some form of initiation into manhood where the elders would do something along the lines of essentially kidnapping the child, stripping the child from the mother, from the family, putting them out in isolation. And then the child would have to fend for themselves out in the wild for X amount of time and go through almost a, a death rebirth experience of so the death of the boy and the the birth of the man and in that process that that would show that they are then able to contribute to the tribe as a whole and not they're not going to be like basically a fucking wet blanket blanket a blanket if shit hit the fan and they know they mm-hmm. would be useful but because we are kind of like mummy cuddled now from birth till well, all the way, all the way up, depending on your life. I mean, that's dependent on your life circumstances. But generally speaking, a lot of men in today's age have never gone through any sort of hardship, or I would say a rite of passage or an initiation to really bring out the the male version of the, I should say the man version of themselves. And in sport, I mean, sometimes you get initiations into a sport team and that makes you part of the team, makes you part of the boys. But generally speaking, a lot of a lot of sports teams and a lot of guys they carry that boy mentality into adult life, and you can see that a lot when you're playing sports by just certain personalities within the locker room, how they interact, how they try and intimidate, how they treat others who they feel are below them. There's mm-hmm. there's a, there's a lot of signs that you can see, and for the untrained eye, or I, you could call like not the beta male. That's not really a nice way of putting it. But for a boy to be in that situation, it's very intimidating, and you don't really, you don't want to step out. You don't want to stand up and show your character, to show your skills. You try and st- you stay in line and you follow who you perceive to be the alpha, and that can be good or bad depending on who the alpha is perceived to be. If the alpha is an awakened male that is aligned with his masculine and his feminine side then yeah, that's a fucking good leader to have. And that's someone who you want to follow their back into battle and you know they're going to have your back and they're going to care for the tribe as a whole. But there's a, there's a lot of sport teams and a lot of sports where the captain or, or sub-captains, they're not, they're not real leaders. They're just physically gifted so they look like males, but they have the spirit of a boy. And mm-hmm. that and that can that can lead into some pretty disadvantageous positions in in game time and just outside of life as well. Because most of the time, when you're in the sporting world, to be a high level athlete, it's pretty much your world. It's pretty much your life, and that's all you care about. You you have to be, otherwise, someone else who is they're going to take your place. And if if that. If, if that is your life, that sporting world is your life, then obviously that mirrors out into your real life with how you interact with other people in outside of the game, outside of, off the field. And it can, be, it, can, it can be hard work. It can be hard work dealing with ex-athletes that never really made the jump into a professional, professional sport. Ones that were almost there, they were on the brink of it, but they never quite made it. And then they, they because they never really got to learn about themselves fully in that in the in those years of development up to that point they then all of a sudden is from there to nobody they're now they have to go get a normal job they have to go and start paying bills they're not they're not like a superstar at their college anymore they're not the person that everybody in town wants to hang with nobody wants nobody wants to suck their dick like they did in college no one gives a <laughs> fuck about them because they're not the, they're not the star per, they're not the star anymore and then that can be mm-hmm. hard 
It could be a hard e lesson to the ego, a hard smash on the ego if they aren't a well-developed male. Otherwise, they're going to, they just fall deeper into that boy psychology of neediness, neediness for attention, neediness for validation of self-worth. And it can be, it can be troublesome in, um, in the work environment because then they normally start to turn into a little bit of a bully. They try to find mm -hmm. their, they try to find their self-worth and self-validation through trying to, trying to force their authority onto others. And that is a classic sign of someone in my opinion, who's operating out of that boy psychology compared to man psychology. Chris, with the, uh, the boy psychology versus man psychology, I don't know how common it is in the UK, but the classic term here, and Larry, I'm sure has heard it a million times, it, it is in the locker room of the field is don't be a pussy. Don't be yeah. a pussy is, is, is when there's an athlete that you feel is just being, and it's, it's, it's almost 99% mental. When you're when you're telling someone don't be a pussy, you're trying to get them to overcome whatever emotions they have at that time, and it's I mean very rarely is it even physical because I feel like we have more sympathy if someone sprains an ankle, uh, saying okay let's ice it, and all of a sudden <laughs> they're having some mental issues, and we tell them don't be a pussy. So where does that fall into this, and um, and and where does that come from? So. A little, I'll try, again, a little bit of a long-winded answer I'm going to give, but I'll try and loop it back around. So in regards to like divine masculinity, there are like four central archetypes of what like divine male archetype is composed of. That is the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. So anyone who's studied Jungian, studied Jungian psychology, these archetypes are kind of like... Uh, these expressions of personality that we that can control someone's inter interaction with others, and um, these four archetypes, these four central archetypes to the divine male, they have what you, they would have their like positive side and their shadow or their negative side, and all of us we're all kind of like, we all have a different balance of each. So some, someone might be a natural born leader. So that's going to be more of the king archetype. Someone's going to be like, you might have someone who's on the football field, maybe like straight into battle head first, not think like act first, think second. That's going to be like the warrior archetype, fighting for what they stand for, fighting for their team. You've got the magician. It's all about creativity, expressing that inner ability to create to bring the imagination into the physical reality and then you've got like the lover which is all about connection with spirit connection with others and i feel like what happens is that each and every per one of us in the locker room we all have these traits and we all have one of these um governing archetype that wants to express itself and if the needs of that archetype is not being met then it creates or it's not being controlled or expressed correctly, you begin to become an, a slave to its uh, shadow side. So the, the, the king's shadow uh, aspect is like the tyrant. So we all know like a tyrant dictator. We all know those people within the locker room that it's their way or the highway. It's like they, they run the show like a dictatorship. And then we have like the, the shadow of the warrior, which is going to be like the, the coward, like the person. Uh, again, there's I don't want to sort of like point any examples of that, but you know what I'm saying when I mean that. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like we all, we all need to be given in an environment in which we can express these parts of ourselves openly, freely and securely without the feeling of uh, judgment, without without the feeling of like you said, if you want to express your emotive side and you want to be open, not being called a pussy ass bitch or being like kind of like shunned into the corner and exiled onto the bench. So it, it what happened, what it seems to be, it's like within any sort of sporting environment is that if the generally the, the king of the locker room is always going to be the coach, the, the, the manager, I believe it might be different with you guys. It might be, it might be the team captain that takes that role. But generally speaking, it, te it tends to be the coach. And the, the coach seems to have that fatherhood or that, that father figure to his players. 
and depending on the the teams um the each individual in the, in the team's uh relationship to their father that can also have a significant effect on the expression of each individual mm. in the team and then how they perform and that's an, another thing we can talk about later is all to do with like the hero's journey so this is like a a philosophy from Joseph Campbell, which is really, really important. If Larry or Josh, if you haven't heard of that, that's something that you should definitely delve into. It's uh, some really interesting shit when you get into that. And um, that's helped me greatly understand the, the male psyche and the, the male's sort of quest of, for purpose and destiny. And you can see that be expressed a lot certain parts of the hero's journey. And one of that is some, a part called the atonement with the father. And the you see an example of this would oh josh good yeah, yeah so um an example of that is the bit on the lion king real famous film the bit when simba is looking up to the clouds and he sees the 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 cloud formation of mufasa and he goes you've forgotten me so you've forgotten yourself and you must return to the pride lands remember who you are like remember who you are and then that was the part of the film where uh, essentially Simba atoned with his father and then he began the transition of becoming king of the Pride Lands or the king of Pride Rock. And that is, there's all of these little intricate relationships at play that, that need to happen in someone's life, in, in a boy's life, in, include on the minutes, okay. Yeah, so that, that needs to happen. And if this doesn't happen, then all of this is then going to be amplified in the locker room because you're surrounded with a lot of other males going through a similar shit, but they don't feel like they're in the environment where they can express this. Each male wants to inherit, like naturally every male wants to live, live up to what he believes to be his fullest potential. He wants to fulfill his purpose. He wants to find purpose and he wants to fulfill it. And if a male isn't given the chance to do that, then they can they can react quite adversely to others who aren't pulling their weight that allow them to do, so just say for example someone's purpose is to um win like get win, win some game because you've got some scouts watching and you're going to get invited to a division one college and then you've got some people in the team that aren't pulling their weight and then you would be that's when you want you, you, the way that you would act with them it's because it's the you show and then you become locked into that boy psychology where it's all about you, not right. about the team. And that's when you can start seeing these things like, like man, up, don't be a pussy or like all, all of these, all these phrases that we hear all too often. And you can get you and you can get into some pretty slippery sort of territory, man. And it can be, it can be, um, it can be hard to really find a way to express yourself openly and fully to and be yourself like uh, uh larry what's your opinion on this like what's your experience if you, is this something that you've experienced in the past of like were you unconscious to this or is this something that you that you were conscious of and you just couldn't you couldn't see in yourself or others or yeah yeah i mean i mean uh uh as far as and and and, and like i said before josh and i grew up in the in the uh in the same kind of a kind of a atmosphere but at the same time you know as a man who, um, and I'm gonna get a little, I'm gonna get a little culture with it. I mean, as far as being being a being a black man in a in a sport like Josh and I played in, you know, um, it's hard to actually have a have a whole voice when it comes down to it. Being being being, you know, the only black guy on a whole baseball team, you try and you try and be tough to show them that hey, you know, what I'm saying like I belong and this that, and the other. So, you know, um, growing up growing up with that kind of adverse. Uh, conditions around you, it actually gives you a whole a whole false sense of of, of having to not be that whole quote unquote pussy or you know what I'm saying not being soft and actually you know what I'm saying making making your whole voice seem a little bit louder than what it has to because of the fact that you know you feel like that's the way things are are you know what I'm saying supposed to be you know so with me you know what I'm saying as far as me being um, in a whole different spectrum but at the same time being in the same atmosphere as Josh it's a uh, it was hard. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It was hard for me. So, Chris, uh, on a lighter subject, the, the, the complete irony of the situation is that we as athletes a lot of times have no problem calling another grown man a pussy. But at the same time, 
We also walk around the streets and go to a sporting event with our face painted and wearing another grown man's jersey with his last name on our back and, and running around just celebrating this man that we don't even know. So I guess, I guess that stems from demigods is my guess, but how did we get to that point where we are idolizing um, grown men that we have no idea if they're good people or not? And, and, I, and I'm not saying that there's anything <laughs> wrong with it i grew up doing it as well but but how did we get there yeah this is this is this is actually something that really fucking pisses me off like it's the same it's the same here in the uk in that like like back okay just backstep a little bit ancestral ancestrally who 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 were the people that were worshipped as gods it's the demigods yeah and they, they would be worshipped and then like in today's age, we're so disconnected from from that sort of connection to those higher forces that we would naturally want to um, align with and try to become uh, in, in regards to just being the best version of ourselves every day. That like the, the new demigods are like the pop stars of the world, the rap stars, the sports, the sporting idols. And we, we look at, the, or I say we, like I don't personally, but just speaking for the masses, we tend to look up to these people like they are gods, like they're, like they're above human. And I don't know why people look up to them so much. I mean, it's great. They're good, they're good sporting stars. I mean, or I mean, I should say they're good at their sport. They're good at their crafts. They are very gifted. But I don't see why people look up to them as gods. They're normal people and they're just as fucked up as me and you. They're just as fucked up as anyone who's listening to this. But we give them this false sense of power. And this is the thing where if you have an underdeveloped psychology, if you have a boy psychology, which a lot of these top athletes do, then they're going to abuse that power just as you see in the past. And you read all the stories of like the of the spoiled prince. And then he and then he and then he's just been spoiled his whole life because he knows he's the heir to the throne and then he becomes the king and he's a real bad king and he treats the kingdom like shit. It's the same with these athletes. The, these athletes go from being like prodigy children and being like from from a young age being put through all the best schools. They get free scholarship into the best universities where they're looked at as like their gods. And they, they go straight from university into professional sport, earning millions of pounds. And they've done no form of self-development, of character development. And they're still that same boy that is just wanting praise and approval. And they end up doing real dumb shit. They do stupid shit with their money. They abuse their power. I'm not speaking everyone here, but this is, <coughs> I'm just, this is from like more football or soccer, you guys call it states mm -hmm. i'm using that as an example but i'm sure it's uh pretty apparent in the states as well with some of your sporting superstars and they completely abuse their power and they're not good role models and then it's very and then it's just weird as well that you get a, that you get like you say you get may you get all of us that we may grown men that wear shirts with these guys names on the back and they still look up to them like they're superstars yet these males obviously haven't got their own understanding of self to be able to see how the person that they're idolizing, their characteristics, their personality is portraying that they're an unawakened being, an unawakened male or female regarding what sort of sex you are and you're lying with. But um, personally, that is something that I, I do get annoyed with, Josh. Like it does kind of bug me how everyone that we look up to, be that in the sporting world, be that in, in, the, in the entertainment world, None, none of them, from what their actions have shown, to me, seem like they're good people. They're just people that are power hungry, and they've done whatever they can to get power, and they've got it. And most of the time, they they abuse it. I don't. I haven't seen any. I mean, there are going to be some examples. I'm not going to shit on everyone, but I, I'm not impressed with the majority of uh, pro pro athletes or superstars or celebrities in this world. Might have been a bit of a Bit of a uh, tangent then, Josh, from your original question. <laughs> that, so what, that is my, uh, that is, that's my opinion on that. What, percent, what percentage of the responsibility is um, of, I guess, parents to coaches. teach the kids, yeah, coaches to educate the kids on not to live and die by every word and action of that athlete, but also, I guess, what percentage is on that athlete to understand that they're in that elevated role and they got to uh, – 
got to act like a, a good human being. It depends what age group you're looking at. I mean, from the age of birth to about seven, we're walking around in what's known as a theta state of consciousness. So theta state of consciousness is essentially like a, a dreamlike state of consciousness. The subconscious is very malleable. It's very programmable. So if you, to, if you have got very bad role models growing up and your parents are pe not ideal parents and they're not installing programming you with what would be believed to be good sort of traits like being honorable being having integrity um you can you can run into some issues and then if and then af after the age of seven where you begin to pro where you get begin to move into like i guess like middle school and high school uh if you haven't had those traits those sort of subconscious programmings tuned into you from a young age you can run into issue because you begin to you, you can begin to misinterpret face value um face value relationships with people and you begin you can you you lose the ability to be able to see through someone or see them for who they really are instead of just what they're saying and that i think it's really important from a young age to have good role models sort like good role models in both your parents and then also within within sporting context to have coaches that are switched on they are i would say self-aware of themselves so that what they can do is just feed the children just just nibbits just like little little bites little bite-sized pieces of like woke uh sort of woke information or woke programming you don't have to get them and sit there and get them to read the fucking Bahaga Vida. You don't have to get them there to fucking translate Sumerian or something to understand what being spiritual is. But you just need to be able to install some of these like real underpinning um, spiritual, uh, I would say, kind of like programs into them so that they can understand themselves better. Because it's like... From, again, from a young age, we're not we're always taught to kind of like follow the leader and not in not to inquire yourself. It's like you want to go inwards and be able to really know who you are, so that by the time you get into these sporting contexts, you're not going to be led astray and you're not going to be controlled and you're not going to be you're not going to have to try and put on a show and be someone you're not because that's the worst poison of all, man. It's it's the worst thing ever to try and have to be someone who you know you're not because you need to fit into sports team or you need to fit into a social clique and over time it's like a poison it it, it, it begin it begins to uh distort your perception of reality and distort your perception of yourself is that yeah. okay yeah for sure yeah, no no not at all so to pull this thing full circle like you were mentioning the hero's journey the reason that i i'm really excited about locker room alchemy is trying to uh add a new way of thinking of individual growth within that team concept because I know and Larry can probably attest to as you climb up the ranks um, and if now I was not the top 10 percent talent guy I wasn't at any level however as I started to climb up those ranks I felt myself trying to conform to whatever was needed at that next level and we always hear like athletes say if um, if you need me to play that position I'll do that if you need me to do this, I'll do that. So we're used to conforming uh, to whatever we need to do to fit into that next tribe. So with that ages one to seven, if we're going to start teaching uh, the younger generation about that hero's journey and to understand the, the values and the, and the importance of uh, a teamwork, uh, but also that at the end of the day, it's about them. And when this team is over it's just them so so how do we uh, how do we get through to these kids tough question um the a great hero's journey film which is one of my favorite films still to this day which i mentioned earlier in reference is lion king if you can get them to watch the lion king and begin to resonate with simba then that shows the whole hero's journey in a great 90 minute sort of package. You get to see the prince, the spoiled prince, 
that then is outcasted. He's then exiled from the kingdom. He, he loses his way in his teenage adolescent years. Uh, he goes off into this into this sort of space that is what we would perceive, what you, he, he would perceive as like a special world because it's not what he knew before, and then he goes through a metamorphosis of character, and eventually becomes the king. He learns all the traits that a king should have, and that and then he goes back and he reclaims the pride lands. He reclaims his uh, his place on the throne, and that's through that's through the, his honor and it, through his. Uh, the integrity of his character so to to do this with kids um i would the the thing the thing is it, it gets it gets into murky waters then josh it's hard because it's like at the end of the day you're still playing a sport and if you're playing a sport you need to be competitive and if you're not competitive it's i mean you're just you, you're gonna face someone who is competitive and you're gonna get smashed and so it's 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 a hard one to 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 do to kind of say, and I don't really have the answers for you to be honest. I do I don't really know, and maybe this is something that you guys are gonna be the ones to find a way. You you guys are gonna be the ones that are gonna find the way to do this because I don't necessarily know. It's like for me, it's about installing good uh, characteristics in your children and desirable personality traits that aren't about scarcity or survival, but it's about thriving. It's about like awakening you want you want your child to be able to express themselves fully and you want them to be themselves and like you said you've got some when you've got people when you're like i play in any position i can do this if you look at like some of the best superstars in the world uh for example football soccer lionel messi cristiano ronaldo uh those guys are pretty much uncoachable because mm-hmm. you, you you why you didn't you can't mold them you can't try and get them to be someone else they were themselves from the get-go and they stood out so what you need is to find a way to allow kids to express themselves, to express themselves through those archetypes, through the king, through the warrior, through the magician, the magician, through the lover, and allow them to express themselves fully in one of those four archetypes or all four. And allow, just allow, find a way that allows them to be themselves and not try to be someone else. Because as long as they try to impersonate someone else, they're always going to be a second rate version of that instead of being a first rate version of themselves. And, Again, I'm not sports coach, so this is something that I'm sure you guys have seen, and maybe you've got some ideas in your head of finding a way to be able to incorporate this into into training programs, into sort of training structures of being like finding a way that allows kids to express their their individuality without feeling the uh, the need to try and be someone they're not. Yeah, that's that's something that I've been really trying to work on the last year is uh and it's been tough because you're you're kind of changing the way that your your brain has been developed to understand sports but really getting out of my own way and getting the players to understand that when they show up day one that they're kind of in charge and it's it's tough to to check your ego as a coach but to get them to understand that their success or their failures can be dependent on them solely and that we're going to be here for the resources that we're going to put in as much as they're willing to put in, but they have to do the work. And uh, at least not, I, I played ball back in the nineties the and early two thousands, but the way it was before it was, it was the coach was almost like the King. Um, you, you went to him and that was your guy. And you were just going to do whatever he asked you to do. And you were going to uh, evolve to his system rather than him trying to pull the, the most out of you. So it's, um, it, it's a tough one, man. I mean, it's one of those things as well, Josh. I mean, for someone your age, someone Larry your age, back in the day, if you were, if you were being coached by someone, that coach probably would have grew up in like the 30s or 40s. That's a completely different world than today's world. And the men that lived in that world are completely different men than the boys that are growing up in this generation. So it's, uh, it's, it, I, I believe that there's going to be a completely different uh, shift and paradigm, or I should say paradigm shift in the coaching world because there's a, a new generation of coaches uh, that are going to be coming through and hopefully they're going to be males that are self-aware and they're able to guide their pupils, their students um, into well, it, into a into a more open-minded 
uh, expression of themselves than some of these older coaches did because it was very old school, which leads me to a question for you two. What's your perception? Because this, this is another thing that it's hard to reconcile with when you start getting all these spiritual beliefs. What is your, like, how would you deal with failure with, if, if just say your team goes on a losing streak for three or four matches, like how, how do you, how do you guys deal with that? I guess I'll, uh, I'll go and jump in Josh first. Um, so kind of a, kind of a, kind of a roundabout answer. Uh, the Larry of, of 10 years ago would show, uh, a weird source of just, you know, aggression leading, leading to, leading to, uh, saying who you're actually talking to. You're talking to 12 year olds and 13 year olds who are, who are probably dealing with a whole lot more serious shit than us losing this ball game right now. Um, and me actually probably taking, taking, uh, taking a whole different approach as far as what I, what I had going on in my own life or whatever. Um, and actually just pouring it onto the kids and us losing that game was probably just masking something that was, you know, going, going wrong in a whole other aspect of my whole life. So, uh, back then anger, and now it's more, you know what I'm saying? Like there's more to this game than us just losing here. All right. I mean, there's a bigger purpose than us, you know, sitting back and actually wondering, you know, so why, why this happened, why that happened, like just processing it, learning from it and actually kind of go from there. But, um, I hate to say it that I feel like I'm probably in the whole minority as far as coaching. You know, like yeah. a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches, uh, um, you know, just like Josh said, put, put themselves up, up, up on that whole pedestal as far as being being the kings and, you know, they dictate this, they dictate, no, it has nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? You put kids in a whole, in a certain position to, um, to actually do what they do and after that, whatever happens, happens. So, um, like I said, back then it was anger. Now it's, it's, it's whatever is whatever. And I think you kind of, kind of process it from there. Yeah, and for me, I'm a. Um, now it used to be a detriment to me as a player too, as just a, a over analyzing guy, the paralysis by analysis. So I took that right into coaching, and if we were losing, I'd just try to like PowerPoint my way to <laughs> to success. You know what I mean? Just like try to try to diagnose everything, and then have a notebook by the end of the game and, and break it all down until I realize it just doesn't work. Um, so as I've gotten older, I've just learned to allow myself to simplify and just pick one thing just to give them as footing. So if try to find one, if it's a threshold where it's a certain point in the game where we're starting to lose focus, or if it's one area of the game, just pick that kind of throw that out as a lifeline and get them to kind of rally around that. And generally, if you can get, especially younger kids, if you can get 12, 12 year olds on the same page, um, I mean, shit, they can, they can do a lot. So if you can get them to buy into one thing, a lot of times it can, uh, it can snowball into some more success. Hmm. Also, I've got another question for you guys as well. I'm just interested in what your perception is on this. Um, so another thing that's hard to like reconcile, it's like, obviously you play, you play in sport. Do you play, is it, do you play to win or do you play to take part and learn? And this, this is the thing, because when I was younger, I was all about winning, and that's all I cared about. And that was really my mentality, like real hyper-aggressive outlook on winning. And, it did, what, and then I, I'd hear everyone say, oh, it's not, it's, not, it's not the winning, it's taking part that counts. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it's, for me, every, everything is all about self-discovery. It's all about learning, it's all about facing adversity. And overcoming adversity, no matter what that adversity is, it's unique to yourself. And as long as you've overcome that adversity, then for me, that's a win. So, for example, it might be that you're playing a game and you get absolutely smashed. And in the first half, you, yeah, you get absolutely smashed. You're, you're a defender and the, and the attacking team is absolutely just raping you and you're just being made to look silly. You go, you go into the locker room with your head down. But you some, somehow, somewhere, you find something within yourself and you come back in the second half. You don't win. You don't win. But they don't score like they did before. You managed to pick yourself up and you were a better person in the second half than when you were in the first half. You overcome that adversity. Like, for me, that's a win. But at the end of the day, you still lost. On paper, you still lost. Your team still lost. So I just wanted to know, what's your opinion 
on that and do you guys have different opinions than mine or do you, what, what's your, what's your perspective? Larry, I'll, I'll take this, uh, for, yeah. for baseball, which what, what we do, um, it's really helped the last seven or eight years with technology because now you can get, I mean, shit in, in a game time setting at an amateur level, like at the college level, you can get a lot of information just on a single player on how they perform, like objective information, how fast they went to first base. I mean, you can, you can set up a couple of machines and it can track all that shit where before you had to kind of dig through the weeds to figure out how you perform where now you can literally walk off the field and get a printout of what your bat exit speeds were, um, what your plate vision was, how you were in the zone, all that type of stuff. So then you can start to get the player to compete against themselves rather than getting just lost in the sauce of a win or a loss. So it's kind of a, a two layered approach of the ultimate goal obviously is to, to win the game. But the microcosm within that is kind of to win the day for, for you personally. Mm, and before, yeah, before technology, good. it was nearly impossible to, to get buy-in for that because you, you, there, you didn't have the, the data. You didn't have the data to, to get the kid to buy into. It's interesting. All right, man. Well, Larry, what about yourself? You got anything on that? Just personal? Yeah, no. I mean, um, uh, as far as as far as when it comes down to just the whole instant gratification you get from the whole feeling of winning, you know, um, uh, what 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 I've actually learned through time is just the, like the fact that with me, like you know, like my my whole upbringing, like if I didn't win, you know what I'm saying, like my parent or my dad was he was on me, you know what I mean. So like um, when it comes to to uh, and Josh and Josh, you kind of you know trying to understand, but like a lot of the pressures of you know winning and if you didn't win you know what i'm saying like you failed this and you, and, and you didn't grow as a person or whatever that all came from my dad you know i mean so like it's stuff like that in which you know the atmosphere we're in and whole culture around us is is a lot of the kids feelings on winning and and and, and winning at all costs and whatever the case may be it's from their parents you know i mean it has nothing to do with the kid has not, i mean usually with our kids especially with the, with the days of you know, social media, TikToks, and whatever. The second after after we get our ass whooped, you know, they're they're sitting there dancing and, and, and doing whatever. No parking lot. You know, they don't they don't care. You know, so mm. um, typically it's the it's the uh, it's the parents want it's, it's the parents' intentions when it comes down to to you know wanting wanting their kid to look good on that platform. You know, so um, like I said, me growing up, my dad he you know he was a he was he was a college a college basketball player. My whole family he was. You know, highly athletic and this and the other. So, like, if we didn't win, then there was a problem. You know, not that it was, not I got my ass beat or like that, but like it, it was, a, it was a huge cloud of just disappointment on that on that car ride home. You know, so like I said, um, when it comes to the kids nowadays, I feel like they still feel that 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 same pressure, even though you know they probably know deep down, deep down that they actually got a tad bit better today because you know they actually rose above you know some some form of uh, adversity. You know, so. Yeah. Now, Chris, I got one more question, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. I know your, uh, your tagline for Primal Alchemy is save yourself, save the world. And we're close to a lot of uh, college players and professional players. What can, and if we put the focus on the individual, what can professional players or higher level guys that are in the spotlight, what can they do? that even if they just need to take a selfish approach at first to better themselves, that is also going to give that ripple effect and um, give off the correct vibes to the younger generation to watch and try to replicate. Okay. So, so this isn't going to be to do with like nutrition advice, fit, like fitness advice. This mm -hmm. is you're more of like in regards to like life advice. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, the, the, the best life advice that anyone can get, it doesn't really matter what age you are, but specifically for teenagers, because it's, it's such a, it's a time where they, everyone's trying to fit in and trying to be somebody, trying to be somebody that they're probably not. The ultimate advice is don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about you. That is the ultimate advice. If you, if you can really embody that, 
you will achieve anything you put your mind to and that's in sport and outside of sport and i i get i get asked the question a lot like i do a lot of like podcasts where it's about biohacking it's like oh do i need my red light therapy device oh do i need to be uh making sure my circadian rhythm is intact <laughs> and it's like yeah okay that shit's great but the ultimate biohack the ultimate life advice is to not give a fuck what anyone thinks about you and to do you be you be you to the full that's where beautiful comes from be you to the full and if you can do that, you will stand out. You will stand out like a mile ahead of everyone else because everyone's trying to be like everybody. But if you are, you, each of us are born with our unique set of skills and outlook in life. And if you can be that and live that fully without feeling the need to hide behind the guise of someone else, you'll stand out and you'll be the person that you dreamed of by just being you and it's it's, it honestly it's 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 a it's a simple philosophy but it's very hard to embody that in today's age and the people that do do that and don't give a fuck you 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 spot them a mile off man you spot you spot them a mile off and they're the ones that they're the disruptors they're the ones that make waves they're the ones that people talk about and want to be like because they're different but they're not really different they're just themselves uh, so yeah, that would be my answer on that one, dude. And it's that, that's the answer I give to loads of different questions where people pr probably want a real in-depth scientific breakdown report of like some of physiology, psychology, all of that shit. But it comes down to the nitty gritty. It comes down to a basic truth is you need to be yourself. Like that's, that's the best advice someone can ever get. And it's the hardest advice to follow. That's perfect, man. That's perfect. Larry, you got anything before we wrap up? Uh, no, man. I mean, um, you know, like I said before, it was a uh, extreme pleasure to to uh, to finally meet the man, the myth, the legend that I've been hearing <laughs> so much about the last the, the last few months. But um, you know, it, everything I heard today carries a lot of weight, and, and it was a pleasure to actually be on this podcast with you today. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Larry. It's uh, great to hear that. It's great to meet you as well. It's great to, Josh, uh, honestly, as well. It's great to see you, uh, you know, really starting to shine and do your own thing. Like when I first met you, you were in one one level of like awareness. You were very, in, you were very sort of like inquisitive. You were, but you were very, you were very open, man. And it's great to see how far you've come and sort of really switch things up. And I think this whole situation, this whole Corona situation that we find ourselves in worldwide is, although it's not ideal and there's some shit that needs to be seen to, but on a personal level, this is a time where people should be reflecting on themselves. They should be like, huh, okay, what, who do I want to be when, when this when this is over it's much like when you're in school and you finish one year at school and then you've got a six-week holiday before the new year starts in september and normally it's like a new start for you and you know oh, i want to like try and recreate your character this is the perfect time to do that but in adult life it's like what do you want to do after this do you want to go back and work a job that you that you probably want to happy doing slaving away for someone else's benefit or do you want to try and learn about yourself learn what your passions are follow your bliss, create your own realities so that you can be much more fulfilled, like much, much more happy that you're living your purpose and being able to like, you know, just that's like live, live, live your dream. And I, I know that, you, I know that you're going to be able to do that, Josh. I've, I've seen, I've seen it in you. I know that you, you're the caliper of man that's going to be able to get himself out there and do this. And yeah, it's, uh, I'm really happy that you started this podcast, dude. I think you're going to be able to help a lot of people. Well, I appreciate it, man. You're the, uh, you're one of the inspirations behind it. So, um, now I know you're a busy guy right now with Primal Alchemy. You got anything, um, you want to, to plug or, or direct some of the listeners? Yeah. So again, it's, it might be a little bit different than what the, the listeners may be interested in or aware of. Uh, so if you want to check out my website, primalalchemy.co.uk, uh, I, I create a line of health supplements on there, uh, superfood supplements. I've got my own clothing range i've sell biohacking tools that are really important in today's age but uh for just something for everybody that's listening without any sort of financial uh, commitment is i've just created something called the superhuman optimization map and it's a free pdf download that you can grab and it's part art piece part infographic and basically it's the accumulation of the last sort of 10, 12 years of my life of everything that I've been researching, everything that I believe that if you were to integrate, you know, less than 10% 
of what's on that map or just research it. If you took a day, like every day, research one of those topics that's on that map. And if you integrate just less than 10% of what's on that map over into your life, you'd be a completely different person. And this is both ancient ancestral wisdom with 21st century science, like all the things on there, I've uh, referenced with the, 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 like the leading, I should say, maverick thought leaders, uh, researchers within those fields. And that's for physical optimization, mental optimization, spiritual optimization, emotional optimization, uh, nutritional keys of things that you should and shouldn't be eating, uh, what I call kryptonites, which are things that you should be staying away from in today's age, uh, stuff to do with ego development models so that you can, so that you can uh, do, do a few personality tests, find out sort of what's your governing archetype, see how, that, um, how you interact with other archetypes, and that might be able to help you quite a bit understand yourself better. And uh, there's, some, there's some really valuable information on there. It's free. It's a free PDF. And I would suggest for everybody, even if you're not into all the spiritual stuff, even if you're not into any of the, you don't have to be into all of it. Just be into something and just pursue it. And I, I promise you, you'll get a lot out of it. So that's what I would say, just as a freebie for people. But uh, other than that, Primal Alchemy UK is my Instagram handle. Uh, you can listen to my podcast, which is the Red Pill Initiation Hour. And um, that would probably be it without having to ramble on too much. And I'll leave all the information and in, uh, the link to the map as well in the, in, the, in the details for this episode. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please help raise the vibe by sharing this podcast with friends and family. For more real conversations, show notes, and to connect, head over to LRAlchemy.com. Until next time, peace.